a six part series hosted by the MRAW Grazing Partnership. Uh, this event is being recorded and, and will be posted online. Uh, so since 2020, uh, the Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation District, the Land Connection, U of I Con Extension, uh, Terra Alosa LLC, Illinois Soybean Association, and the Pasture Project have partnered to provide education and resources to increase regenerative grazing practices in and near the Embra River watershed. We've hosted field days, uh, had online training sessions, online informal discussions with grazers, farmers, landowners, educators, and stakeholders about the benefits of regenerative grazing, and look forward to hosting more events and sharing resources. Uh, you can find the page about the EGP and our events and resources on the Champaign County Soil and, Soil and Water Conservation District website, uh, which I will share in the chat. <clears throat> Uh, we are so happy to have you all here today. Uh, my name is Nicole Haverbach uh, of the University of Illinois Extension, and I will be facilitating today's session. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of the Embra Grazing Partnership uh, for organizing this series, uh, Mallory Krieger of Terra Alosa, uh, Jennifer Jones of Illinois Soybean Association, uh, Ivan Dozier of Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, Jesse Schaefer of the Land Connection, Katie Bell of the University of Illinois Extension, and Kelsey Virgine of the Pasture Project. Uh, this series is funded in part by North Central Stairs uh, Professional Development Program. So today is our final session uh, in our series, and we are joined by Travis Hood, a sales representative with This Old Farm Incorporated, and Joseph Fisher of Fisher Farms uh, to discuss their experiences associated with grazing and value chain development. Uh, Travis and Joseph will share their knowledge and experiences associated with value chain development and grazing, uh, followed by a moderated question and answer session. So uh, as we are progressing uh, through today's conversation and presentations, uh, feel free to drop your questions uh, into the chat and we will get them answered. Uh, or if you feel comfortable, you can also raise your hand and ask those questions verbally as well. So it looks like we do, Travis is back. So uh, I will turn things over to Travis to introduce himself and get things started. Hey, good uh, afternoon. Um, I apologize. Uh, we have had some connectivity issues here uh, for about the last 10, 12 days. Uh, we, we were victim of a couple of those tornadoes uh, from two weekends ago. Uh, the plant survived mile and a half east and a mile and a half west there's there's some pretty good destruction so uh our internet does go in and out so i apologize on that in advance uh but uh, my background is actually in turf and plant and soil sciences lateral move uh, i was a golf course superintendent for 27 years uh, i could grow grass on a wall um and then i uh decided to parlay that into uh uh pasturing hogs uh, that I started out in uh, Southern Indiana, um, flat ground in Southern Indiana, and uh, started out with just a couple of sows feeding friends and family, uh, parlayed that into a one-way ticket out of the golf business, uh, moved the farm to Northeastern Kentucky for a better market share, Cincinnati, Louisville, Lexington. Uh, I ended up direct marketing uh, right at 600 head a year uh, without selling livestock uh, and then my plant and soil science uh, education came in handy because uh, that part of Northeastern Kentucky was anything other than flat ground. So obviously you needed a, a good good ground cover to, to cease the erosion that, that hogs are very capable of causing. So uh, it's a lateral move, I promise. Uh, and as, uh, as I went on, I decided or you know figured out that I had my job career choices backwards. Uh, I would have been a better farmer had I started out working on this side of the desk in the meat industry. Um, but all of that uh, stemmed from turf and uh, a love of the land, so to speak. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I find myself here uh, being able to whack. I'm a better talker about pasture based animals and uh, supply chains uh, than I was actually uh, doing it because uh, it's a young man's job and I wasn't one of those when I started it. But uh, here I am, I'm glad to be on this side. I can help a whole lot more farmers where I'm sitting now than I could being a farmer. Uh, so it's really all about relationships and I love uh, love building those relationships and seeing what makes farmers tick and how we can fit into that, uh, fit into their scheme. Oh, 
Awesome. Thank you, Travis. Uh, I will turn things over to Joseph now to uh, share a little bit about his uh, background and introduce himself. All right, I will go ahead and start sharing my screen as I start introducing myself. Uh, so please let me know if this is good. Thumbs up. It looks good. All right. All right, great. So I am Joseph Fisher with Fisher Farms. Uh, we are a farm in southern Indiana. Um, we are part of the uh, area in southern Indiana that actually has a rolling hills, but not too far from us is what Travis referred to as the nice the nice flat fields that uh, are better for uh, maybe crop ground than uh, <laughs> raising cattle. Uh, so we are a, as you probably figured out, Joseph Fisher of Fisher Farms. It is very much a family business. Uh, so our family has uh, owned our home farm uh, for six generations now, uh, me being the sixth generation with a seventh uh, generation on the way here soon. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're located near Jasper, Indiana, uh, for folks that are somewhat familiar with Indiana, um, small town outside of Jasper, but we were a conventional beef farm until we started selling direct in 2004. And at that point, uh, we decided that we weren't uh, very comfortable with some of the things that were going on in the you know, quote unquote conventional beef industry. And so we wanted to you know, do things the way that we thought was important. So raising them naturally without growth promoting and antibiotics, but then also as the topic of this conversation is doing more rotational grazing and really uh, incorporating more regenerative agricultural practices into our production model. Um, and showing kind of the good things that can come from that. And so what I thought is for this uh, discussion, I talked a little bit about who we are at Fisher Farms, but then also give a, a brief overview of our rotational grazing process um, on like an annual basis, and then also how we work with other farmers to kind of incorporate that. I just feel like that might help you know, lay the groundwork for questions and thoughts um, for the rest of the group, so you, so you at least have a little understanding of uh, maybe what makes us a little bit different than others. So first of all, since we do sell direct, I thought I'd uh, put this slide up here real quick. It, it kind of hits on how we go to market. So we go to market as bundling the benefits of premium, natural, local, and sustainable. So premium, super important to us. Uh, the meat's got to taste good at the end of the day. And so we're pretty particular about our genetics. Uh, but then also that they're just raised in a consistent way so that that meat on a restaurant uh, menu is consistent each and every week. Uh, we do that by raising them naturally. So no growth hormones or antibiotics, uh, but then also minimally processed. So no additives during that processing stage. Very similar to, uh, or I should say identical to the folks at this old farm. You know, they're, they process minimally as well. So they're not adding anything in there as well. And Travis and team local. So that's become more and more of a discussion point, especially as COVID has started to enter the, uh, the discussion and messed up supply chains. People want to know a little bit more about where their meat's coming from and that traceability all the way back to the farm, in addition to the fact that it has a lower carbon footprint to deliver when it's traveling, you know, 50 miles versus, you know, 500 plus. But then also sustainability. So practicing regenerative agriculture and really rewriting that narrative on beef's impact on climate change and how it's maybe not what uh, the media would like to tell us about uh, plant-based uh, diets and all those things. And so just really showing how rotational grazing in particular can have a really, really positive impact on the environment. So uh, like I said, thought I'd run through our uh, process uh, real quick uh, as far as what we're um, doing to our fields. Feel free to jump in with questions as we're going through this. Uh, but we have uh, fell in love with ryegrass at uh, Fisher Farms. Uh, it's a great, it's an annual ryegrass. So we do plant it each and every year. But the great thing about ryegrass is it grows every day that it's over 45 degrees. So as you know, we've kind of gone through the last you know, month or so here, we have some days where it's 55 and we have some days where it's 40, uh, but ryegrass can bounce back real quick. Uh, which gives us really good yield during the winter, spring, and fall months. And so that's why we like to plant it. It actually grows so well that we have to use wheat uh, along with it and a few other um, forages to help hold it up. 
because it'll grow so fast during these months that it'll actually kind of knock itself over and stomp itself out. Um, but this just worked really well for us in getting cows and calves out on pasture earlier, you know, in areas where you know, maybe our neighbors don't have as much grass cover this time of year. It also has really good root mass too, which helps hold that soil together and makes it a little less muddy. Uh, not that we don't deal with our uh, fair share of mud this time of year, uh, but just the incredible root mass that ryegrass creates helps with keeping that ground together uh, during this time of year. So as that grows, eventually, it you know when there are more days over forty five than uh, well, uh, than less, we are we've got too much ryegrass for our cows to eat, and so at that point we come through and we chop that ryegrass. Uh, for silage. So we will be able to store that in our silage pits, uh, which we can use to feed cattle year round, but especially in the winter months when there's not as much to eat outside. Uh, this is in like, comparison or in, in difference to like hay, uh, you know, baling hay. And so then what we do is after we chop that ryegrass, we come back through and we plant either uh, sorghum sedan, which is what actually that's my dad, uh, what he's measuring there. It's a, it's a great summer crop. It grows really, really fast. Uh, so we'll plant either that or we also do corn for corn silage as well. Two plants that grow really, really well when it's really hot outside, but don't grow hardly at all when it's cold. And so that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the best plant on that field for that time of year uh, because that's going to get us the most production out of those fields. So then, you know, throughout the summer, we've got our cows. You can see how tall that sorghum sedan gets. <laughs> it can grow, you know, up to like five or six inches a day. It's pretty crazy uh, to the point where you just kind of see where the cattle are vaguely at um, because they've just got so much good eating. Uh, but then on the corn side of things, we're chopping that for silage as well, which gives us a good uh, higher energy uh, diet for our cattle, uh, for our finishing calves. Uh, but without being like the super high energy, it's, it's that in between because we're harvesting the whole stock. So during this time, uh, as you probably guessed, you know, you, you can't have cattle on cornfields. And so what we're doing is we're working with network, what we call network farmers or partner farms to help graze cattle for us. And so this works really well for us because there are many farmers in our area that have pasture ground but maybe don't want to deal with the investment in cattle, or maybe they don't want to deal with cattle in the winter when it's muddy and cold. We work with you know, some folks that are in their 80s. They love having cattle outside their, uh, outside their house, but maybe don't want to deal with it when it's cold and freezing and muddy. And so that's where we work really well with folks uh, like this, where we will actually drop our cattle off so we know the genetics of those cows know that they fit within our program. Uh, but since they have the grass at that time, uh, our cattle get to eat. We pay those farmers per head per day to uh, graze our calves. We give them mineral, we give them guidance. But anyway, this is just a good way for us to expand our operation without uh, Fisher Farms going out and buying more land, uh, but then also giving other local farmers the opportunity to raise cattle in maybe a, a less risky way and in a way that uh, makes more financial sense for them and instead of dealing with uh, the market because we're able to give them a premium uh, on those cattle for introducing rotation grazing on their farms. So after that, uh, we also have fall and winter grazing. Uh, so I think that's a, a good example of why this ryegrass is our favorite. You know, we've got cattle out there you know, after a frost when the ground's frozen, we've got them in that middle picture, you know, they're out grazing on that ryegrass in the fall and, you know, with their mothers as well, because, you know, it's able to grow during that short window before it gets really cold. Uh, we want to get those, those fields covered again really quick so that we've got a good base uh, going into the winter months as well. So this is what I mentioned a little bit about working with partner farmers, but I uh, thought I'd kind of hit this uh, before we go into more of the Q&A type things. Um, but we're always looking for farm partners to graze with us. We feel like it's a great way for us to continue to grow um, because it, it adds more equity kind of in our 
uh, community by giving those farmers the opportunity to work with us. And so we will meet farmers, like we say, where they are. So we have some farmers that are like, I got land, but I don't have time to deal with it. And we're like, that's fine. We'll rent your uh, farm from you and we'll do all the work, checking the cattle, building fences, all that. Uh, but we have some where they're like, I really want to do it. I don't mind moving them every day after I get home from work. If you can just drop off the cows and pick them up when I run out of grass, that would be great. And so we do that as well. And then we also work with uh, them on field planning and soil testing too. Uh, we have a lot of farms that have seen kind of the uh, improvement in their soil uh, by doing rotational grazing. And so we work with them to show them how they can you know, rebuild the soil on their farms and you know, get back to how they remember it maybe when they were kids, when uh, the ground maybe wasn't as eroded and things like that. So. It looks like the chat. Uh, so Jenny, uh, curious what you paid to others for the custom grazing. I believe we're paying a dollar twenty per head per day, and then I think it's a dollar forty, dollar forty-five for a cow calf pair. And that's per head per day. But we uh, <laughs> we actually just had to change that number because. As many of you know, the cattle market has kind of gone crazy lately. So yeah, I see Travis uh, nodding his head there. <laughs> and uh, so we had to uh, kind of adjust with the times there uh, because we, we do offer a premium. And really what we want to do is we want to make it uh, financially uh, attractive to folks. You know, we don't want them to be doing it for what they could get on, on the conventional market. And so because there's going to be more work involved, right, with moving them every day and that sort of thing. So we want to make sure it makes sense for them, but it also is going to make sense for Fisher Farms because that's, you know, less labor that we have and less uh, acreage to manage. Awesome. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, and thank you for answering that question that we had uh, in the chat. Um, I know that you and uh, Travis also prepared some questions for each other, so uh, I wasn't sure if maybe we wanted to jump into that. Sure. Yeah, I can, I don't know, unless you're chomping the bit, Travis. I, I was wanting to learn more about your uh, farmer meetings. I have seen them from afar, or at least mentioned on your website and on uh, social media and things, but we'd, we'd just love to learn more about what those are and, you know, what got you started doing those. Uh, honestly, it, it goes back to, to building those relationships, uh, trying to break down those uh, those barriers that, unfortunately, uh, the new farmer will often look at the, uh, a processor as the necessary evil. And uh, we, we are far from that. We, we want to work alongside those farmers uh, to get help them make economical decisions, uh, as well as, you know, timing. Most of them starting out green grass. Uh, they really don't have uh, any sort of bench benchmark of when an animal is ready uh, for harvest. Uh, so these meetings cover everything from uh, marketability of your product to actually farming, raising the animal. Uh, most of the times, you know, uh, as uh, at one of your other questions, Joseph, was about, uh, you know, that, that ever uh, evolving problem of, of ground beef uh, and all this trim. So uh, we educate our farmers uh, from a level of uh, value added products that we offer currently uh, on down the line into, you know, research and development. Maybe what you're looking for, uh, we don't do yet. And we are one of those very few facilities that are willing to, to go that extra mile work with you. And what do you have in mind? Um, and obviously that, uh, that, that takes, a, takes a little bit of load off the producer for just their ground beef, which like you said, with the current cattle market, uh, we look at that two different ways, but one of them is a positive uh, because the, the playing field's relatively leveled now for that small family producer uh, comparatively to, to the, the big ag. So the cost per pound on ground beef isn't, uh, isn't as wide of a, of a variance as it was just you know three years ago. Uh, COVID notwithstanding, which, you know, all bets were off during that fiasco. But uh, uh, but with that being said, those meetings, you know, we cover any wide array of topics. 
usually the months leading up to those meetings kind of, okay, here's our, one of our FAQs. And uh, so let's cover this, but uh, you know, and we try to urge those producers that we feel like need to hear this to come to those meetings. Uh, of course, most of the time, the meetings are, are the same producers that, uh, you know, don't necessarily need that education. So, uh, you know, it's word of mouth. Uh, and then we try to publish newsletters, uh, videos, things to uh, to maybe help those that, that don't want to come to the meetings, but they can they can work the internet better than I can. But uh, but no, it's the topic. One of my favorites that we do every year is uh, basically um, trailer to freezer. Uh, to where we walk these producers, these farmers, these customers from our unloading gate for the cattle all the way through the, the slaughter room, through the processing room, into the value-added goods kitchen to see the actual process that uh, that that that, um, that that product is going to take before it comes into their hands or their, their customers' hands. So, uh, and a lot of that goes, you know, and I know anyone in the in the processing aspect of the meat industry is you know, you're going to have that farmer. Well, all you have to do is, well, I promise you, it is a lot more complicated than that. And if we've made it look easy, well, then then we are successful in that regard. Uh, but uh, one of the others is uh, grading yields. Uh, that's another one we do every year, explaining to the farmer uh, that you, uh, and as Joseph knows better than anyone, um, you you can't feed an animal up to prime. Uh, it has to have that genetic disposition to marble in the first place. Uh, and every farmer that requests those grades and yields, they want to see if it's prime, if it's high choice uh, or, or what have you. But we try to explain to them that the most important number on there is the calculated yield percentage. Um, you know, you could grade it up to prime, but if it's got a calculated yield grade of 7.14, ultimately what that means is the economic impact of you just paid us $175 to throw away fat. Uh, so if it was prime at 1,600, odds are it's probably prime at 1,200 pounds. Uh, 400 pounds ago, and you start to do the math on the uh, economic impact on the invoices. So it's it's passing along this education, but more or less it's, uh, it's dispelling myths, it's dispelling rumors uh, to get us all working on the same page rather than you know working against one another. Um, so it's really what it boils down to is relationships. You could have any topic you want, but it's that FaceTime with the farmer that's so hard to get when it's planting season, when it's harvest season. So we'll take it any way we can get it. If we get through to one, well, we, we're, we're one closer than we were. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think uh, one thing that jumped out to me is just the fact that you've got all the farmers in the room at the same time, or as many as you can get, I guess, um, and just the community that that builds. Because I know we often talk when you're, you know, hanging out with folks that are doing everything, you know, the old way, right? It's hard to introduce change and things. But when you're with other folks that are trying new things, it makes it a little bit more, you know, you're not the weird one anymore. You're you're part of this group that's, you know, bucking the trend. And so I, I thought that was a really cool a way of doing that. And I, I think it's great that you all are, are doing that kind of stuff. Well, I appreciate that. Well, it's, you know, uh, we get about 130 phone calls a day, another 400 emails a day. Um, and about the time you think, okay, I've been asked every question. Uh, I have heard every outside the box marketing scheme, plan, raising of animals. About the time you think you've heard it all, well, someone walks in that door. And every one of them are, are worth listening to because you could have 10 farmers in the room. Each of them have some grain of the same idea, but they have an understanding of the different parts. And now we've got these 10 farmers in the same room and we can take these 10 different parts, put them together. And next thing you know, we're thinking outside the box, pushing forward. And, uh, and you know, and it's about a three year cyclical change to where it was, uh, you know, might have been just freezer beef. Then it's direct to market retail. Now it's uh, customizable subscription boxes. Uh, I mean, who knows what's down the pipe? Some farmer out there is can't sleep at night because he's thinking of the next wave, the next cyclical change. And we're 
we're we're a year behind if we're not ready to listen to, to those or the bits and pieces, the spitballing, if you will. So it's uh, the, the next great idea is out there floating around in someone's head for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know we've sometimes turned to like Facebook groups and things like that. You know, those are, are weirdly like a great source of those types of discussions too with folks. From and, entertainment. <laughs> and, and entertainment. And <laughs> entertainment. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's spot on. They're maybe less um, region um, appropriate though. So I think that's where like your um, folks, with, you know, getting people from the same area together is helpful because when we're getting a, ideas from folks in Canada or maybe even Europe, you know, it, it, it may or may not actually apply to, to what we're doing here, but at least, like you said, it, at least, at least it gets the gears turning. That's right. See, uh, a question here from uh, Lucas about uh, comparing net farm income between conventional and rotational grazing. Uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, I know some of the things we see we have uh, as a traceable processor um, all the way back to an ear tag. Uh, you know, we, we see all the different uh, critically endangered breeds. Uh, we see all the different uh, levels of husbandry, whether it's 100% grass fed, pasture raised, supplemented with grain, all the way down to feedlot conventional. Um, and with that being said, there's again, that, that playing field is leveled right now with the price of beef. Uh, but what we are seeing is uh, two years ago, uh, we had an Amish gentleman who uh, was routinely bringing us 100% grass fed beef. And they were routinely, you know, live weights in the low 800s, uh, you know, utility grade, really nothing fantastic to speak of. Uh, so myself and one of my good friends who happens to be uh, 88 years old, was doing 100% grass fed before it was cool out of uh, economic need back in the 60s. We went over there and the first thing that we came to realize was this gentleman was uh, rotationally grazing his brood stock uh, with his feeders. So you know when there's competition, the biggest ones, the mature ones are gonna get all the good stuff. Um, so first thing we did was uh, you know, got his brood stock off of the rotational grazing. Uh, of course, then my my 88 year old friend uh, introduced him to a, uh, a about a if I had to guess had to be 40 first generation bull uh, to get his genetics back in order. And I'm not kidding you. His very next uh, 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 load of cattle that he brought in, we performed grade and yield because we bought several of those for our own, to fill our own orders. Uh, he broke the glass ceiling of it was it graded prime abundant with a calculated yield grade uh, of 2.11. And if you uh, if you nerd out on these grades and yields like I do, uh, it doesn't get better than that. Uh, what that basically means is there was no thrown away of fat, no uh, no extra work needed done by the butchers ultimately, which leads to a higher yield from that carcass. Uh, so with that being said, um, when, you get it, when you get it dialed in, there could be very little cost difference between rotational grazing uh, and, and conventional grazing. Uh, the one bad aspect of that is, is you'll get a lot of 100% uh, grass-fed farmers uh, to, to do more than just maintain their herd through the tougher winters, they will feed haylage. Uh, and so these farmers um, have gotten it into their heads to, to not bring these animals in in February, March, April, sometimes even May. Uh, these farmers will want 30 to 45 days of green grass in their rumens uh, to not to thwart any sourness that might be in that fat from that haylage. Um, I myself, I can I can taste I can smell boar taint from two counties away, but I don't taste that sourness in 100% grass fed beef that's been on haylage. But uh, I, I could understand their their concerns. Uh, so if there was any sort of economic impact, it would be timing uh, and and dispelling the myths that 100% grass fed is somewhat seasonal like strawberries. Um, 
but uh, you know, so it's, uh, and then of course, when you get into those uh, late summer, fall harvest dates, um, I think everyone at the table knows that uh, you got to be getting those dates a year or two in advance because uh, we could fill those August, September, October slaughter dates five times over. Uh, but then we're cold calling farmers in March, just trying to find one. Um, so that, that's a whole nother topic of discussion there to be sure. But, uh, but I'm no, uh, I haven't done a lot of math on the, on the actual husbandry side of conventional versus 100% grass fed. I'm sure Joseph is well more versed in answering that question. I can just, uh, uh, we wanna talk hogs, I could do that all day long, but uh, those, those are far from 100% grass fed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can speak to you. But first of all, Travis, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I agree with everything you <laughs> just threw out there. Um, but on as far as the net farm income between the two, I think a lot of it comes down to how uh, efficient you are maybe on your farm. So rotational grazing has the potential to get you more yield per acre, which in general is great, right? And so if you're working with a set number of acres, if you can get more cattle raised on that farm for with, you know, out expanding, uh, you're obviously going to be more uh, efficient because you'll just have, or more profitable because you'll have more throughput. So doing that in a way, you know, I mentioned how we at Fisher Farms have found worked really well for us to get the maximum yield out of our fields each year. That helps us keep our you know, income or our net farm income, I should say. Uh, higher because we can get more throughput. Um, you know, we figure roughly about a half an acre per head on our farm. And mo most folks figure about two acres uh, per head um, in this area. You know, out west, it's like 10 plus. Uh, so, but what you're doing is by putting the best, you know, forage, the best uh, plant on those fields all year long, you're maximizing the photosynthetic value of that acre. And we want it sucking as much CO2 out of the air to create, uh, you know, food for those cows as we can 365 days of the year. So what that also means is when maybe plant growth isn't the best, what are you doing to feed those cattle? Are you using hay, uh, which can sometimes be good, but often can, you know, not have the highest nutritional value, uh, depending on how you baled it or, you know, how long it's been sitting there where it's been sitting, if it's been, you know, outside and getting maybe a little moldy, or if it's been in a barn, or if you're doing like silage, silage worked really well for us. I understand sometimes you, know, you may or may not have the equipment to do that, uh, but we've found that that helps us keep things efficient 365 days of the year, and therefore gets, helps with you know, ultimately profitability because we're not buying hay we're not, you know, bailing hay and the kind of cost associated with that during the winter months. We have like a feed truck that we can throw silage in and, you know, drive out to a you know, cattle uh, lean to structures where we can feed them. And so that's how we've done it. And that's how we propose to other folks to do that. Often they can't jump in and do the whole spectrum right away. So what we do is we work with them and say, all right, let's start with this ryegrass, you know, corn rotation. And then we work with them on like silage. And then, you know, it's, it's like a stepwise thing. I mean, we didn't start doing this all in one year. We, I, when I was a kid, we were doing square bales, then we did round bales, then we did silage. And not that I don't want to necessarily downplay hay because that is, I think, good. Uh, but just at least at our farm, that was a way that we were able to get a little bit more efficient uh, on our farm. And so there is more work. Uh, I don't want to necessarily say that it's less work than conventional. You know, when you use con the conventional process, those processes that were implemented, and I'll, I'll word this carefully, they were implemented in a way to reduce costs, right? There, the beef industry went through a period of time where it was all about how can we produce this uh, beef for as cheap as possible. Um, and I think we've seen that come back around where, you know, quality has become more uh, at the forefront of conversations. There, there are definitely some people that will will and will always care about cost, but uh, now that there's this kind of opportunity to introduce quality back into the equation, uh, I think that opens the door for uh, some of the rotational grazing things that do ultimately add some cost, but maybe don't have to add as much cost if we can keep our efficiencies on the farm. 
So long way of saying, yes, it is probably a little bit more of a cost and effort from the labor side of things, but there are things you can do on your farm if you're, if you really get purposeful in how you're managing that farm through your 65 days a year. Yeah, I might add that uh, due to the relationship building we've done, I've seen, uh, uh, I kind of, I'm really interested in the genetics uh, right down to maybe uh, certain breeds. Uh, I have one uh, farmer who is scale. He does feed just dry grass hay all winter. And he raises some, uh, some old line shorthorns and Murray grays along, alongside some modern conventional Angus. And the one thing that we have seen is the shorthorns and the Murray grays, uh, they seem to actually gain uh, a little bit from Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day uh, on just untested grass hay, as opposed to the uh, more conventional new line Angus, uh, he's found that they weigh exactly the same on Valentine's Day as they did on Thanksgiving. So it's more of a maintenance uh, than it is actually uh, growing that animal for with uh, uh, a set harvest date in mind. Um, and with that being said, he has many, many more animals uh, than he has slaughter dates. So uh, from a economic impact, uh, if you know you're going to harvest four beef a, a month, 12 months a year, that's 48. He has just relegated himself to always having 60 and choosing the four in that month that, that best fits uh, what he deems as finished at that time. So that's one way to do it. I'm not going to lie. That's kind of how I did hogs. If I needed 10, it was a whole lot easier to pick 10 out of 100 than these are my last 10. They better be ready. Uh, so with that being said, we're working with this guy getting his genetics to perform uh, in the manner in which he intends to raise them, uh, which truthfully goes all the way back to if you're not going to cow calf um, and you're going to buy feeders, uh, the first thing is buy feeders from an individual that is raising in a manner in which you intend to. Uh, you know, it's, you couldn't go to the sale barn, get any run of the mill, got a good price on, on, on this particular crossbred calf. And now I'm going to expect it to perform well on 100% grass. Uh, that's only going to work if that's coming from a 100% grass farm. Um, and certain breeds are, have a better disposition to perform, disposition to perform on grass alone. So it's really knowing the animal. Uh, having a relationship with a farmer who is who's breeding these, cow calfing these, uh, to get, you know, you got to get started headed in the right direction. Um, and that's first things first is you have to know which direction you want to head. So uh, it's, uh, it, it really becomes quite fascinating when you start getting down to the genetics and disposition of the animal itself. And usually it takes to get eight or 10 of them on the rail and have those grades and yields perform to see uh to see where you're at because there is that glass ceiling of the 30 month window too um those uh that that amish gentleman i spoke about a moment ago that brought us uh prime abundant we you know a we weren't sure if it was possible in 100 percent grass-fed animal and b we didn't we weren't sure it was possible in 100 percent grass-fed animal under 30 months of age uh and and he broke through that uh uh that misconception uh, that that we had just from the hundreds and hundreds that we had seen. So, um, and 30 months, 30 months or older isn't isn't the end of the world. But uh, at most federal facilities, that that does lead to an extra line item on your invoice uh, that uh, that all producers are are trying to to keep those at a minimum, to say the least. Is everyone familiar with the the plus 30 uh, regulations regarding? Uh, Bovine animals? I guess that's a good question. I'm 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 taking for granted that that we're all on the same page, but this is a, an educational platform, so I guess I should ask that question. So, plus thirty animals. Uh, it goes back to uh, what is it? Bovine encephalitis, otherwise known as mad cow. Um, the federal government requires that all beef animals 
uh, that are deemed over 30 months of age, they have to, uh, the things such as the vertebrae, other parts of the, uh, uh, of the innards are deemed uh, as specified risk materials. So uh, it is unlawful uh, to receive T-bones and porterhouses from animals deemed over 30 months of age. Uh, you still can have the muscle, the fillets and strips, but that bone does have to be discarded. And from a uh, processor standpoint, uh, if we have one come through the slaughter floor and the federal inspector deems that animal to be over 30 months of age, uh, they have to, after they go through that animal and it gets put on the rail into the cooler, that room has to be cleaned down, uh, which is a hit on our efficiency. Uh, so, you know, as a processor, I think it's fair to say, yes, you're paying for our services, but more importantly, you're paying for our time. And things that take a little more time usually end up as an additional line item on the invoice. And we want to keep those to a minimum as much as the producers do, I promise you. Uh, but with that being said, uh, when it comes to 100% grass-fed beef, uh, you will be pushing that 30-month window. So I highly urge you to keep accurate birth records and, and ear tag all those animals to just like Antiques Roadshow, have that provenance to prove what you have. And then we have a leg to stand on. And as your partner in this whole process, we're willing to go to bat for you with those federal inspectors to, to make sure that, uh, you, you know, you get what you deserve. Travis, you mentioned uh, like yield ratios that uh, for different producers. I was wondering if you could maybe talk more about, you know, are you doing that for all uh, producers that bring in animals and maybe kind of what that is so that folks have an understanding of that? Uh, we, we perform it on all animals, all, all beef animals that we purchased uh, for our use, whether it's our retail, wholesale, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, there is a, a, a customer base out there that, that do not have a farmer. Um, they don't, they have a doctor, they have a lawyer, a dentist, they don't have a farmer and that's a shame. Uh, but we do fill that void. Uh, we will, we will gladly source animals for them through our, our black book of farmers and whatever husbandry level they desire. Um, so with that being said, we do perform those grades and yields on all animals that we purchased and we perform grades and yields for the producers that request them. Uh, and that falls, uh, into, uh, you know, we've got the cow calfers that uh, have performed grades and yields for 10 years straight on every animal that comes in. They pretty well have a handle on their closed herd. So they're saving that, that a little additional uh, cost by not performing them anymore. Uh, but they are the ones that are growing. Uh, so to meet their demands until they add a few extra cows to produce those extra calves for their growing market, they will buy feeders. So of course they will perform those, uh, those grades and yields on the feeders they purchase because obviously they don't have a handle on those genetics. And, uh, uh, but no, it's, uh, it's really, we see anything and everything. Um, the farmers it seems are always most interested in prime choice select. Uh, and I don't blame them. That's what I would be interested in too. But it really goes into the formula and the math and the calculations to come to that square inch of the ribeye, the amount of fat cap at two o'clock at the seventh rib. Uh, that's really the biggest impact to the farmer or the farmer's customer for that matter. The more we have to trim off, you know, as we're charging, you know, most facilities, most processors charge by the hanging weight. The hanging weight includes all of that fat cap that the customer maybe did not request on their cuts. They want us to trim that down to a nice quarter inch. They're still paying for that three quarters of an inch we threw in the barrel. Uh, so it's the most profitable beef on the planet is a mid to high choice with a calculated yield grade of 2.0. Uh, we see 2.0s uh, in low select. Uh, we see high primes uh, at 7.1. Um, but usually it comes down to the 100% grass fed that are the closed herd genetics. Those guys have got it dialed in. They're gonna be no higher than 2.7 and they are always mid to high choice and you can sprinkle in a low prime in there every once in a while. But uh, really the most important is, is have that calculated yield grade somewhere between two and three 
then you're getting a higher yield on the package weight. Customers getting better value for their dollar, and you did, and the farm and the producers not, uh, you know, throwing dollar bills in the grain bucket just to add fat. So we have, um, oh, sorry, we have a uh, clarifying question in the uh, in the chat that I was just going to say. Maybe you saw that, but. Um, uh, Lucas said, Travis, so grass-fed animals may take longer to become harvestable, which makes them more expensive to process. Uh, well, I mean, yes and no. Um, so if, it, if that animal is deemed to be over 30 months of age without proper provenance, I mean, yeah, that, that's going to cost about $40 more than it would if it weren't plus 30. Um, so it's it's not a huge expense, but... You know, if you bring in a pot load, 25, 30 head, and they're all plus 30, 25 times $40, that, that gets pretty salty pretty quick. Uh, you're better off taking that and having some patties made or some beef jerky or snack sticks or something, being quite frank. But uh, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's just the animal. It's the time of year, hard winters uh, on 100% grass-fed animals. There, there's a whole lot of variables there. And you're going to have the good, you're going to have the bad, you're going to throw those out, and the median right there in the middle is is your average. So, um, you know, it, 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 so the short answer to the question is 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 potentially, uh, but not once you get your uh, level of husbandry dialed in, then it can be forecasted, it can be estimated, and uh, and you can get them in here 24 to 26 months of age uh, with with proper provenance not have any additional unneeded charges and as far as how having them take longer to be harvestable uh that's really going to bo boil down to uh what joseph had spoke on 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 trying to maximize some weight gain through those tough winter months that's really what it boils down to um you know spring so april may through september october i mean there's there's adequate pasture given the fact that it rains a little bit uh but you know that those critical times are going to be you know november december first frost uh through march april that's really where uh you know the 100 percent grass-fed beef farmers that's really where you're going to be judged uh so if you weigh them on thanksgiving and again weigh them on valentine's day you know, three quarters of a pound to a pound a day of weight gain in that time frame is actually quite uh, quite impressive. Uh, but if they're just maintaining and and you lose that four months and they weigh the same on Valentine's Day as they did on Thanksgiving, uh, ostensibly you're you know you're you're four months behind, uh, and and it's going to be that much more difficult to to get them uh, to a processor before that thirty month uh, birthday, as it were. Yeah, and, and that's in comparison to like, so at Fisher Farms, we don't do 100% grass fed. We give them like corn salad, as I mentioned, uh, as a, a supplement. We have these lean tube structures along the pasture where they can come in, get some to eat, and then go back out on pasture. And so by doing that, you know, we're giving them a higher energy diet, but not like the super high energy diet that you often see in like maybe the feedlot model, uh, where, you know, if they want that crazy growth all at the end. We want that consistent growth their whole um, life. So we're shooting for about 1.75 pounds of gain per day uh, for really their entire life. And that includes uh, over the winter months as well. So we are able to process our beef at around 18 to 20 months. Uh, so just kind of give you an idea for the, the difference that is factored in when you do that 100% grass fed. Awesome. Thank you both for clearing that up. Um, do either of you have any uh, other questions for each other that you'd like to uh, discuss? I, I was interested, Travis, in what you've seen in the last, you know, three years. It's obviously been a pretty tumultuous uh, time for the, the meat world in general, uh, but just how that's affected you, you know, are you growing? Are you doing different things that you were three years ago? Uh, and I know that this could probably be a really long answer, but maybe just, you know, a couple of things that you've really seen that have changed in the last three years. Well, uh, I would say from the farmer aspect where I'm sitting, what I am uh, most impressed with is the fact that uh, 
uh, I, you know, in speaking of COVID, um, you know, I can, you know, there's, there's historical things that's happened in my 50 years on this planet where I know where I was standing. Uh, one of those is when Walmart, Kroger, uh, Meyer, uh, the big box stores, when they ran out of meat. Uh, and that was March 28th, 2020 at 3.08 p.m. Uh, because it was just a typical March day. I'm calling my farmers, trying to talk their four on the schedule to see if they can't find two or three more just to make it worth opening up the slaughter floor. So all of a sudden that telephone lit up like Las Vegas. Uh, we had lines of cars pulling in the parking lot. It was, uh, for the lack of a better term, it was complete and utter insanity. Uh, but it was a good place to be. It was equivalent to being in the golf business the day after Tiger Woods won the Masters in 1997. I apologize if no one gets that reference. But uh, but with that being said, uh, our farmers are actually better for it because most of them, prior to COVID, uh, you know, they have an animal in the backyard and they're like, okay, it looks ready for harvest. So then they would call a processor. What do you got next week? Well, we have Tuesday open. That went out the window with COVID because we, in the course of eight working days, uh, we filled our slaughter schedule up in three species uh, for two and a half years. So what that meant was that farmer had to do that farmer math to estimate their daily gains uh, from the birth date to, to be able to get within a a two or three week window of to estimate when that animal would be ready. Uh, how that affected us is uh, some of them were spot on. Some of them were four to six weeks off, which is still great because it put them, it had them put the pencil to the paper. They're better farmers now uh, because of that. Uh, but how that affected us, um, we were, uh, we were uh, harvesting beef uh, three days a week uh, at that time, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and our slaughter schedule would be full if we had 15 beef on each of those three days. Thursdays were hog days. We, we, our slaughter schedule was considered full uh, if we had 35 hogs on the schedule. Now, fast forward to current times, uh, farmers, uh, that they're okay with getting up at 4 a.m. on a Monday morning to bring us cattle. So uh, we now uh, uh, harvest beef four days a week, hogs still on Thursdays. Uh, but right now, if we're really cranking at full volume, uh, we went from 60 beef and 35 hogs a week to now we can comfortably do uh, 110 beef a week and 70 hogs uh, a week. So we... we <laughs> It's that synergistic growth between the farmers and, and uh, the, the processing facilities. Um, as the farmers grow, we're not doing them any favors if we aren't growing right along beside them. And, and COVID, uh, as you know, if, if I might be the first person to say when it comes to the direct to market farmer and, uh, and the small family owned processing facilities, uh, dare I say it was kind of a blessing um, but, you know, it, it definitely fell in line with our mission. Uh, those communities that had that small farmer for decades prior to COVID. So that those members of that community went to the grocery store. They're out of meat. They went to the butcher shops. They bought them out of meat. Then they started driving around the country looking for animals in people's yards and then knocking on doors. And then they're like, oh, well, we never thought about selling a quarter of a beef or a half beef. Uh, so there was a whole lot of new direct to market farmers that fell in line in that time frame just based on demand. And even if after COVID with a hundred, you know, if that market grew 110%, now that it's kind of waned, everything's getting back to normal. We still kept 20% of that 110% growth. That's, that puts us somewhere around, you know, in those uh, lower volume harvest times between March and May, we're still 40 to 50% more than we were prior to COVID. That's a win-win. And, uh, and again, it just, it, it, about the time, you know, okay, we've got this figured out. Who knows, COVID happens, uh, you know, any number of things. So it definitely keeps us on our toes. But the bottom line is, is we put the producer first. And because, you know, it's no secret, 
uh, that we as a, as a family owned small business and a federally inspected meat processor, we can't be successful at all without direct to market producers. And, 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 you know, so you're seeing the new generation that are coming in, they have new questions. They have the outside of the box thinking we can't get tied up with the old guard. Of course, you know, we still take care of them too, but uh, it goes back to that growth and developing those partnerships and, uh, and open dialogue and communication. And if, if there was anything good to come out of COVID, it was farmer math and relationships because, you know, people were calling us, hey, you know, what do I do? What do I do? Hey, you know what? This is the first time we've been through this as well. So let's, let's figure it out together. And that's exactly what happened. Prior to COVID, producers bring four to 10 beef a year. Now they're bringing 40 to 80 beef a year, same person. So, uh, you know, hey, that's farmer growth. That's small conventional fam or small family farms, conventional 100% grass fed. We see them all and we love every one of them. There's another question here from Lucas. Major barriers come to mind that can make the transition from conventional to rotational regenerative grazing difficult. Uh, <laughs> First thing comes to my mind is weather. <laughs> yeah, that's I, a that's a I, variable I, in just about anything that takes place outdoors. But I'll let I'll let I, I talk a lot, and sometimes I talk a lot and don't say anything. So I'll I'll let Joseph take care of this one. Sure, and I'll, I'll be a uh, cognizant of the time here too. I don't know we only got a few minutes, uh, but I think the big thing is uh, just that security of knowing. Uh, where you're going to sell those animals at the end of the year. So when you're dealing with, you know, some farmers at, at the end of the day, you got to pay your mortgage, you got to pay all those uh, bills that are coming up. And so anything that gets you off of the way you've always done things can be scary. And so uh, I can speak from like the Fisher farm side of things. What we try to do is we try to uh, show them use cases, uh, show them examples of folks that have done this and you know become more profitable, not less profitable. Uh, but there, there's always going to be a little bit of that hesitancy um, in knowing that there may be more costs involved, you know, up front, or there may be more labor involved up front. And are they going to get a return for that additional cost, that additional effort uh, for their cattle? So if those cattle are going to a new market, um, and by new market, I mean either they're selling direct or they're working with somebody like Fisher Farms or this old farm. That get you know kind of gets them a premium over what they would get if they're selling the conventional route. And that conventional route, generally speaking, doesn't care <laughs> for lack of better words. You know, kind of what you did to that calf up to that point. I mean, they're they're going to care about some things, but generally they're not going to uh, necessarily give you that premium for your additional. Uh, efforts and cost because they don't have that traceability to the end customer. And so it, that's ultimately where we see it come into play is those farmers have to have a different market for their beef than sending it to one of the big four. That's conventional farming is highly efficient. It's a well oiled machine and the profit is in the volume. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I see. So, you know, you're not going to, you're going to be a little bit profitable with one, but you're going to be much more profitable with semi-tractor trailer loads. When it comes to the regenerative grazing, uh, with the right market, you have added value to your one animal, your five animals, your 10 animals, uh, for the individuals that are conscious about what they're buying, conscious about what their family are eating it may take a little bit more conversation to have to explain that value. Uh, but the one good news that's come from the Netflix, Hulu, uh, the various subscription cooking shows is our customer base is wildly more educated than they were just 10 years ago. So they will, if you have a value added product in hundred percent grass fed, low carbon footprint, regenerative animal, taking care of the land, these people are now seeking you out. Uh, and that, that's really the biggest difference I've seen. So I wouldn't say 
uh, I'm trying to keep this positive attitude here lately, and I wouldn't say it's a barrier at all. I think it's an opportunity to wax poetic about the great things you're doing with the animals and the land itself, because this, this land is going to be here long after we are. Well, thank you both. Uh, and uh, thank you. I've got 12 o'clock on my on my time. So uh, I'm going to close things up for today. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I thought we had some really good discussion. Uh, we will post the webinar recording to our YouTube playlist soon, uh, which you can get by visiting our website, uh, which we will drop in the chat. So uh, with that being said, uh, thank you all. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.